you everyone. Uh, just to explain, gloving isn't my first love. My specialism is uh, later medieval women's history. So there's quite a bit of uh, medieval stuff in this tonight. I hope all of you like castles and whatnot. Um, so to start off, I suppose I can quite rightly say that the fear of the supernatural and the urge to protect oneself and one's family for, from it are as old as human society itself. Um, Ireland is no exception in having a long and colourful history of belief in supernatural, often malevolent forces, and in having an accepted system of protection and appeasement, i.e. magical practice, in order to control and or placate these forces. In the early modern period, one way of doing so, I hope I get this right, is encapsulated in, yay, in this object here, uh, a witch bottle. Um, it's a, an unusual example in this country of urban-based folk magic working. When I say folk magic, of course, I mean the magic of ordinary, so-called ordinary people. Uh, this bottle was found in excavations on the site of Bolane on Mercer Street in Dublin. Uh, and what was part of an old monastic settlement that was also one of Dublin's leper hospitals from about 1200 to about 1500. The bottle is older than this, though. This kind of bottle uh, with the face of a man, uh, if you can see there, you can see a man's face on it, uh, is a, called a Bellarmine bottle. It's after the Italian cardinal uh, Roberto Bellarmine, who lived between 1542 and 1621 and was a fearsome individual, uh, a cardinal inquisitor, um, a, a prosecutor of Giordano Bruno and Galileo, so not someone you'd mess about with. In fact, the kind of face that would turn back any kind of demon or witch who wanted to come into your house. Um, it's a pottery bottle, this one. It's from about 1600. It was found intact and sealed. Uh, this is important. The witch bottles were sealed up. There's many items put in witch bottles. X-rays reveal there's a quantity of um, stuff, as it's been called in this. Uh, it, they include old and bent nails. Um, so uh, people have rightly come to the conclusion that it is a witch bottle. It's a common folk magic that was used around Europe in the early modern period. It is a ritual object which was ritually concealed within a house in order to trap witches and also to overthrow cur curses. They are usually placed near doors and windows and at hearths, which were all seen as entry points for witches into your house. The most common contents of a witch bottle are bent pins and urine, although a rate nice. A range of other objects were also used. It's thought that the uh, bending of the pins killed witches in a ritual sense, which meant that they, they then exited to the other world or were trapped inside the bottle. The urine attracts the witch into the bottle because it is a human scent, which a witch is attracted to. This is the thinking. She becomes trapped on the sharp pins. I say she because it's generally thought to be a she. Uh, the contents, hair, the magic metal known as iron, um, which uh, anyone here who's in, from the countryside and knows the efficacy of horseshoes against fairies will attest to, um, in the form of pins or nails, urine, occasionally fabric cut out into shapes, nail clippings, bits of skin and hair, all appear to be designed to confuse the witch and trap her. It is, also, it is, of course, the witch in her spiritual form um, because it's believed that the witch travelled about in a kind of an amorphous form that could be trapped in a tiny bottle. Um, this witch bottle uh, is put in the ground by ordinary people, but it's also put there by magical practitioners, what are known as cunning folk, um, cunning men and wise women. So these are sort of good magicians who are paid to ply their living as folk who uh, work against bad magic. Um, so um, if anyone's seen Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, anyone seen any of that yes. or read the book, mm -hmm. you'll come across this idea of magicians who battle bad magic. It's sort of that idea. Um, one way of using the witch bottle as well is to... Um, cause a witch discomfort um, and it is to attribute to the witch bottle um, the characteristics of the witch's bladder. 
So if you think of the witch bottle as the person who has cursed you, the witch's bladder, you fill it with pins and nails and it makes it uncomfortable for her and then you heat it and supposedly the witch will then fall to the ground crying out in agony and that's one way of um, getting rid of um, the trouble she's brought on your house. This sort of folk magic working um, on the house and carried out by women um, is, is quite interesting because I often think of it as being like a sort of crazy domestic battle because folk magic in many ways is confined to the sphere of the house. So women had to have played a massive part in it because women were in charge of the home and the, the spaces women could go to in the past are limited. They had a limited sphere of influence and this is where they could work their folk magic. This is where they could protect their family against cosmic forces out to harm them, i.e. other women as witches. So it's a sort of a battle of women in some ways. That's not to preclude men from it. Men were often hired as uh, cunning folk to uh, place the witch bottles there or to, to say what went into it. But it is predominantly a battle of house versus house invader. And that's what that symbolises. Cunning folk, to give you a, a definition of them, were known as wise women, wise men, conjurers and wizards. They were an integral part of Irish society right up until the early 20th century. Over the centuries, thousands of people must have consulted them regarding a wide range of problems, but particularly those concerning affairs of the heart, theft, sickness, and most important of all, witchcraft. They were multi-skilled or at least professed to do so. They practised herbalism, uh, treasure seeking and love magic. They revealed the identity of thieves and divined the whereabouts of lost and stolen property. The more learned cunning folk also practised astrology, while the less learned pretended to be masters of the art. And much changes. The most lucrative aspect of their business was the curing of those people and animals who were thought to be bewitched, and also the trade in charms to ward off witches and evil spirits. So a cunning person is who you went to, and they're very common uh, throughout Irish history. Um, there's a lot of work being done on them in Britain, for example. There's a very good new book being brought out, which they figure in, uh, called Witchcraft and Irish Magic by Andrew Snedden, um, in which he talks quite a lot about them, in case anyone's interested. Although we don't know who buried the Dublin witch bottle, it's impossible to know now. It's interesting to speculate. Perhaps they hired a cunning person to do so. Perhaps they did it themselves. We do know, though, that a range of people um, acted as kind of battlers against bad magic. In 1684, the Reverend uh, Kyo, a Church of Ireland clergyman, noted with distaste the Catholic practice in Roscommon of hiring cunning folk to cure fairy-struck cattle. Using professionals to battle the forces of darkness was by no means a Catholic practice, though. It's uh, widely noted amongst Presbyterians in 17th and 18th century Ireland also. In fact, one known prosecution that we do have on record uh, for practising popular magic was in 1609 against a Church of Ireland rector at Mellifont in County Louth. The Reverend John Aston was accused of, quote, diverse invocations and conjurings of lying spirits in order to locate some lost treasure at Cashel. Nice. <laughs> That's exactly what you'd use it for. Uh, and also to find out, quote, what Hugh O'Neill was up to. Yeah. Hugh O'Neill, of course, had fled in the flight of the Earls two years before, but still loomed large on the Protestant Irish consciousness. So he's trying to find out what Hugh is up to on the continent. Um, he uh, wasn't really terribly punished for it, though. Uh, generally, the judicial authorities in Ireland tended to be profoundly uninterested in um, prosecuting magic makers. It is a feature of Irish history. So this sort of folk magic using witch bottles is very common in Britain and has been well mapped out. The work still has to be done on Ireland. Eamon Kelly at the National Museum has started this. But of course, what we don't have are the same amount of untouched 16th and 17th century buildings that they do over there. Um, and so the evidence here is much rarer. It is an importation though, there's no doubt about that, from English and Scottish settlers in the 16th and 17th centuries. 
Um, it is not something that is mentioned in medieval or Gaelic sources that I have come across, this idea of a bottle to trap a witch in. But of course, uh, people use different types of protective, protective magic, which I'll also refer to. Uh, for now, though, with regard to the witch bottle and the early modern period, such hidden objects within buildings were often part of um, a, a lot of personal artefacts that people put together um, under floors and in thatch roofs, for example. Together, they are known as a spiritual midden. So they pretty much, over generations, gather together familiar objects um, as a means of repelling evil magic. Um, historically, the placement of selected objects or animal remains in strategic and hidden parts of buildings is uh, widespread from the Bronze Age, believe it or not, and is especially prevalent uh, from Roman times. Uh, within uh, standing vernacular buildings, particularly during extensive renovations, uh, rather than simple surveys, um, people find objects all the time. Builders uh, find them quite a bit alongside windows, beside the hearth, under the floors, in uh, wall spaces, in attics, and even in the thatch. Well, there's a spiritual midden there. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of iron used. The belief is widespread that iron harms supernatural entities, um, especially fairies, which would apply to here more so than in other countries. Um, dry cats, lovely. Um, which people would uh, put in their houses. They didn't kill them uh, as far as we can tell for it. Um, well, we don't really know. I mean, I think people say they don't because cat lovers write history. You tend to get a lot of academics with cats. Um, but um, they may have had a kind of a, a dead cat that they kept for the purpose. Um, so they put them in the building, um, a, a dried cat. Um, cats are odd creatures, to say the least. I'm a cat owner, I'm allowed to say it. Um, they are credited with being able to see things other creatures can't, to see into the unseen realms. Um, also, um, witches were held to have familiars, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Familiars could take the form of cats or toads or, particular, or any kind of animal that the witch was kind to. Um, but putting a, an animal in as a guardian, which is essentially what this is, into your house... What we think they were trying to do was to have a cat in your house ready to fight with the witch's familiar and distract it. So that's basically what they were trying to do. It was like a spiritual battle would happen with the cat. What you also get in Ireland are horse, <coughs> horse skulls. Um, these are found quite a lot, um, especially when uh, floors are dug up. Uh, there was a dig in Port Marnock um, a few years ago and they found eight horse skulls. Um, under the, now, okay, so from examining the horse skulls, what seems, it seems to have been an old horse skull. I mean, it wasn't killed for the purpose because the jawbone was gone, so it's been there <coughs> quite a while. So when a horse died, in some uh, folk accounts, people cut off the horse's head and waited when they needed a new building and then buried the horse's head underneath, which is slightly Godfather 2, but, um, <laughs> or is it 1? But um, it's because... Um, Horses are seen as good luck um, objects. Again, it's the idea of a establishing a ritual presence in your house that brings you good luck. And also, uh, some uh, folk accounts have it, if you put a horse's head under your floor, the hollowness of the horse's skull helps the acoustics when you have people in dancing. So it sounds better. So there's actually, yeah, there's, there's like a, a really kind of shallow reason for it, but also a deeper magical one in order to protect your house. As I've mentioned, magic is practiced extensively around the home uh, in Irish history. People's uh, lives in the home were bound around by customary practice, by social norms and conventions, by religious beliefs, such as the sometimes very thin layer of belief provided by Catholicism, but also by superstitions and a belief in the magical uh, properties of objects. It's hardly remarkable that people believe this. Um, if you think of saints' relics and how people think about that, it's very easy to understand how people uh, project magical beliefs onto objects. 
Um, in the earlier period in Ireland, um, the abandonment of houses appears to be marked by the deposition of ritual objects, which is another very interesting um, part of this study. Uh, they're domestic objects. They are rotary cornstones, wooden troughs and plough implements, which is what people are finding in pits or wall slots, and they're usually early medieval. Uh, these types of objects, which are used in the preparation and production of food, were practically and metaphorically associated with women, and in particular with, um, or sorry, with the household, and in particular with women, for the benefit of the household. These are women's items um, that women dealt with in the household. At uh, Deer Park Farms, which is an early medieval Irish site, which has been um, comprehensively excavated. An oak trough with a wooden shoe last inside it seems to have been deliberately left behind on the floor of the smaller house of a figure of eight type house. This wooden trough, which um, early Irish literary sources state was a woman's property and used for kneading dough or presenting food, was apparently over 150 years older than the house and must have been one of its cherished items, which was handed down from woman to woman. So the deposition wasn't accidental. It seems to have been a powerful magical object left there for, for a ritualistic reason, as supplication to ancestors perhaps, to mark the death of a matriarch, to mark the end of a line of the family, who knows. Cornstones are used for preparing bread and cereals, which is a very important aspect of the early medieval Irish diet. And food preparation is a woman's task entirely in the early Irish world. So it's possible that these objects are uh, associated with generations of nurturing women. So why smash them at a particular time when the site is being abandoned? Um, it seems to mark a key event. We simply don't know why they would do it, but it is a period in which they do it when they leave or when they seem to abandon a site. And it is objects associated with women. Um, so the witch bottle of Bolain fits into this practice of burying stuff, um, even though this particular type of item is quite new on the scene in Irish history. Uh, during the 16th and 17th century period, um, we do find these witch bottles and spiritual middens because the type of houses being built improve. Uh, this period is known as the Great Rebuild. Um, stone chimneys are starting to get built and rooms are sealed, as it's called, to create an upper floor. So houses are becoming more intricate, so people are beginning to fill voids in the houses with spiritual middens. It's why we tend to find them in this period more than any other. Um, fireplace or chimney middens were open at the top and provided a chute into which worn objects associated with the family in their daily life are sent in. It's important to point out, no one ever puts new stuff into a spiritual midden. It's always really well-worn stuff. It's been worn and worn and worn. Um, so it's very much associated with a particular person. Um, and a lot of them are stuff from children. Um, children were supposed to attract witches. We all know the fairy stories. It's based on actual folk belief that witches liked the smell of kids. Mm -hmm. And um, they would be attracted to it. And then the objects in the midden would confuse the witch. Um, interestingly, witches, if they got trapped in a witch bottle, um, were not supposed to be able to move backwards, which is a bit of a design flaw, a mm -hmm. um, bit like a Dalek who can't go upstairs. So uh, they couldn't move backwards, so they're trapped forever in the midden. Uh, witches also, if you got them into a, a spiral, which is why um, pins were twisted, would endlessly go through the spiral. That's the belief. So they would never be able to break out of it. So it's a kind of a living hell for them. Um, but that's what you were actually preparing in your house for which you tried to break in. Um, yeah, this cool bag in Wicklow. So, um, so this is cool bag. This is an oven. Um, an oven is discovered beside the, the hearth, um, which contained numerous items, um, many of which were made of, unsurprisingly, iron. Uh, one of which was a pewter spoon, which dated from about 1600. It's how they dated this. Um, you know, terribly, this was found uh, of a couple of years, I mean, 30 years ago or something. Amy Kelly writes about it. 
and it was decided not to keep what was in the oven because of course back then they weren't particularly aware of what spiritual middens were so we don't know what was in it um, which is a shame because we don't get many of them in this country uh, but anyway we do know there was pewter and some iron objects so the likelihood is um, it was a, a spiritual midden. Uh, we often get shoe deposits, always. Shoes are really important magical objects. Um, this, is, this is this article by Trapping Witches in Wicklow. It's a hobby. Um, shoes are really important magical objects, uh, particularly, again, children's. And you always only ever get one. Um, and it's because a witch flies into a shoe and can't turn around, so she gets trapped in a shoe forever. <laughs> um, so this is why you get them. Uh, you find them everywhere. I mean, a lot of study has been done. Um, you get um, at least 1,200 have been discovered in England. Um, there's more because lots of local societies discover them. and They haven't all been collated. 26% of those found have been on a ledge in a chimney. So it's hidden right out of sight. But to stop a witch coming in, of these at least 40% belong to children and were very old and well-worn. Um, this has been found, this is a child's tiny hobnail boot, which was found in the thatch of a house at Moneystown uh, near Roundwood in County Wicklow. Um, so we do get it here. Um, again, it's, it's an early modern find, um, so we've still got a lot of work to do on earlier finds than this. Um, another object found in thatch, uh, which may have been placed there to protect it, by, and from entry by evil spirits um, is a small wooden cross which is uh, found um, near Lacken in County Wicklow. Uh, so people are, I mean that's quite, quite a very obvious one to stop the entry of spirits. Um, but what I think is fascinating to think of um, is the, are the people who did it and, and why they so fervently believed that they were basically under attack. And these are rudimentary magical means they're using to protect their houses from these witches that seem to be flying all around the countryside. And what I'll talk about just in a little while is the fact that the idea of a witch in this sense is not a particularly native Irish idea. There is a very different idea to practitioners of magic that you find uh, being talked about, say, in the witchcraft trials of the 16th and 17th centuries. That, that idea of a witch flying about, uh, going to the Sabbat, sacrificing babies, is essentially an, an importation into the country. It's not something that was particularly taken to here. But I'll talk about it in a second, because I want to, want to talk about first is uh, human sacrifice, which also happened here. Um, the Irish buried objects to ensure ma magical protection. Uh, they may have also buried human beings uh, to ensure magical protection as well. There's an early medieval grave um, between 5th and 6th century at Collierstown, in County Meath, um, it's a burial which is very unusual. It's a mature adult woman in a grave lined with timber, uh, which is exceptional in itself, the way she's buried. But also, uh, the grave contains burnt grain, which indicates a purification ceremony of some sort. The archaeology has suggested that this and another one at uh, Ballygarran West during this period also of a mature adult woman or of Romano-British or Anglo-Saxon women um, who had possibly moved here and founded dynasties. It's quite unusual. It has been uh, theorised that these women, through their unusual atonements, uh, appealed to local gods to look favourably on the new dynasties they had founded and perhaps lingered in the uh, landscape as protective ancestral spirits. The idea is that they were buried alive on unpleasantly, that they were matriarchs and that they were interred in such an unusual way in order to draw the attention of gods to them. That's just one theory about it though. Um, it's interesting, when I say mature women, it's like 40 in that period. They were like basically at the end of their um, useful in terms of biologically effective lives. They may have been grandmothers, matriarchs of new dynasties, um, on to carry on to sort of carry on the protection in the spiritual realm. Uh, there's another burial at the Curra, which certainly does definitely seem to suggest um, uh, yeah, a live burial. Uh, the woman is aged between 20 and 30. Uh, when the grave was opened, it was discovered that the body was spread and not bound, as would have been more usual, and the head was pressed against the top of the grave. So she was buried alive. Um, 
Is it, as has been postulated, because she was a sacrifice, it's unknown, as some kind of ritual? Uh, was she herself a practitioner of magic? Again, these are just uh, theories, but they're centered on the fact that the individuals are female, um, and there is certainly an element of folk belief in supernatural doings between older females and magic, which you do find. Um, to continue with the theme of burial, it's also been noted that the majority of deviant burials in Irish medieval Ireland were bodies uh, laid face down. They mostly were female as well. I think I have one. Yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's from actually from Britain. I couldn't find a good one, but you can see the bodies laid face down uh, in the grave. In the post-Christian period, this is, um, this is noteworthy of deviants. Um, by burying individuals in such a manner that deviates from standard burial, the community is solidifying a deviance in the person's life. Behaviour that acts against common social, social values is punished in death by setting the individual apart. Uh, so deviants traditionally include witches, uh, suicides, criminals, disabled individuals, uh, diseased individuals, or someone who's suffered an unusual and violent death, vampires as well, thought to be vampires, but they often have their mouths stuffed with rocks. That's the sign of a vampire death as well. In Christian burial grounds, deviants can also mean that they were unbaptized or broke some religious code by continuing pagan practices. Uh, the period we're talking about is the post-Christian, the introduction, post-introduction of Christian uh, habits here. A normal Christian burial means the body is oriented west to east in an extended or lightly flexed supine position with no grave goods and is simply inhumed rather than cremated. Face down or prone burials like this are often interpreted as especially negative because the face is in the earth. Therefore, your face isn't pointing upwards, ready for the rising sun on the last day or when the sun rises. Uh, so in Judgment Day, you can't get out of your grave. Um, also, they change the orientation for a lot of deviant burials, so it doesn't follow the, the, how the sun goes. Um, deviant burials are also commonly isolated, away from other sacred burial grounds, or buried in a ditch, hurriedly. Again, these are all symbolic or magical gestures used by communities to um, halt impending supernatural events perceived as negative by ordinary people. This manipulation of physical events in order to produce a magically beneficial outcome was obviously believed in and engaged in wholeheartedly by numerous communities over the years. However, not all deviant burials are negative. Many burials that are dis dissimilar to normal ones are actually elite burials. Deviants can be a positive thing. Individuals who lived extraordinary lives may have had extraordinary burials. Those from an elite or ruling class, while a minority population, may have burials that are different. Difference can be due to different religious beliefs, ethnic background or special position within society, so we do have to be slightly careful. However, the fact that women are strongly represented in the burials is thought-provoking and speaks of some form of deviant behaviour that women were continuing to engage in in the immediate post-Christian um, society in Ireland. The first assumption has got to be that they were participating in activities which we know the society disapproved of, perhaps as magic workers. Sorceresses, poets, female poets were especially dreaded in Ireland, believe it or not. Um, in the, um, the list of laws that we have belonging to us now, that we have left to us, um, female poets weren't allowed to have custody of their children if their marriage broke up. They weren't seen as um, respectable enough. Or I know some poets probably shouldn't either, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, they're dreaded. Um, it's also because poetry is magical in medieval Ireland. There's power in words. And when women have that power, it can be especially dreadful. Um, so there's a whole part of that. But also, there's a body, which I'll talk about a little bit. There's a whole body of work in Irish penitentials and laws about women using magical means to control things like contraception um, and um, control birth. So there's obviously a fear of it. And women may still have been engaging in that sort of activity using charms, 
magical invocations to try and control rituals of contraception and birth and even abortion. We, we have all the information available to us in the laws that it was happening. So in a new post-Christian era, it's probably that they're engaging in something like this that isn't sitting well uh, with the authorities. What's really interesting, in the immediate uh, hundreds of years, couple of hundred years after the introduction of Christianity, is that you get an explosion in the rise of loan words concerning magic. So what this tells us is that it didn't just, magic just doesn't appear, because it just doesn't in a society, but what's happening is that magic is being talked about by clerics. They're using Latin loan words about it and they're condemning it. So the tide is turning. So maybe some women in particular, and the way, there may have been men as well, because we know men certainly were involved in magic, are not participating in this and they're being rewarded with deviant burials. It's a theory, but um, you know, it's something to think about. Um, so what's, what's magic in Ireland? Well, uh, it's probably a bit of ancestor worship. Um, because you're using ancestors ritually interned, possibly buried alive, to intercede with uh, gods for you. Uh, there's some use of human sacrifice in a ritualised setting, we think. There, there's other magical rituals, such as prophecy, which we have descriptions of. Uh, and it's a period where it's time when magic is becoming badly thought of, but it doesn't appear to have been particularly badly thought of before. So what's native in old Irish uh, the art which included magic of the Druids is known as Druidect, and the sources show them to be magicians first and foremost. There's the famous use of puppets, which we have. Uh, one, uh, this one is from a version edited by Liam Bratnock from the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and you can see here a description of what happens when you want to curse someone. So write it down if you're interested. The offended druid, possibly along with a full contingent of students representing the seven poetic grades, would rise before sunset and proceed to the top of a hill where a white thorn, hawthorn, grew. The druids, or druids would stand with their back to the tree holding a clay image of the object of the satire. When a north wind blew, they would chant the satire, which is a poem, uh, while piercing the clay image with a thorn from the tree. Evil death, short life to car, spears of battle will have killed car. May car die, may car depart car, car under earth, under embankments, under stones. So that's a magical spell which mm -hmm. druids would have done. Uh, what's interesting about the spells that we do have left is the fact that they are a performance in the Irish tradition. They are not uh, designed to be done in secret, um, they are designed to call attention uh, because, of course, it's a society that's tightly interlinked. So if they see the Druids doing this, word will get back to him, and Kyra will be very worried indeed. Uh, if you look at magic in other societies, if you look at, say, Roman magic, uh, they would have curse tablets. So they would write a curse on a tablet, and then they would bury it. It's very secretive. Um, it would take the form of something like, I hope uh, Lucius dies of the plague. And you'd put it as near to his house as possible. But the Irish one is different. Uh, there's, there's an element of... of public performative ritual and um, so they're obviously not afraid of it it's obviously a part of life which everybody was aware of uh, in the surviving tales uh, druids are seen uh, performing all kinds of magic and divination such as cloud divination an art which is alas uh, lost to us i should say plenty of work as a cloud diviner <laughs> in medieval ireland though you could probably still make a living today at it um, the filly, uh, which we of course now call poets, would probably have served as prophets or seers uh, since the word itself is originally meant to have, um, is originally thought to have been used as a uh, diviner. Poets, um, therefore, their roles were, were um, rooted in the metaph metaphysical as well as uh, the literal world, the actual world. Closely related, as I've mentioned, the poet is the satirist. Um, uh, or concha as it's known any poet could perform satire but this particular class of poet was deadly at it and by deadly I mean actually deadly it was thought that satire could kill you um, at a feast there are, there are laws of course there are laws about who could sit where at feasts in medieval Ireland 
um, the, the poet was on the right hand of the chieftain, which is the position of honour, because no one wanted to annoy the poet, because the poet could turn his gaze on you and satirise you to death. Um, in, I think it was 1440, I think it was 1440, um, a Lord Lieutenant uh, of Ireland, as he was then, uh, Sir John Stanley, was uh, recorded in the annals as being satirised to death because he basically annoyed a poet and people believed that that happened. So they had that power. Um, it's called magical wounding, which you can do with words. Formal magical roles then are dominated by men in the Irish tradition. Uh, women tend not to inhabit these roles. Um, we, we have very little evidence about what women did in that particular world. Um, they don't seem to have inhabited those roles, though. They seem to have been male-dominated. Women are more associated, as in the rest of Europe, with folk magic. Interestingly, though, if you look within the literature for clues about magic, uh, the most formidable wielders of magic are women. Um, now, whether this said something about the uh, underlying fears of Irish society at the time uh, about goddesses or not, um, battle magic is worked by women quite a lot. Uh, with the Morrigan, of course, um, using her skill to help the Tuatha Dé against the Formorians in, in the, the Battle of My Turin, and in, um, with Bav, Maka and the Morrigan sending forth, I think I have this here, uh, magic showers of sorcery and compact clouds of mist and a furious rain of fire with a downpour of red blood from the air on the warriors' heads, and they allowed the fair bullock neither rest nor stay for three days and nights. There are references to women as witches, as using witchcraft. The continuous, the conscious association of such practices with paganism, magic and evil doing are, of course, uh, the conscious uh, and deliberate choice of wording by Christian writers. These, these are written down in a much later period wishing to disparage such arts that could not possibly be condoned in a Christian context. In a story called The Death of Crimin, the Queen Monine is called a witch and is responsible for the death of her brother and ultimately herself, a casualty of her scheming to get her son on the throne. From her appearance here and in other tales, her character shows clear elements of having once been a sovereignty goddess and therefore worshipped. As a goddess, she chose her king, her consort, after he had shown himself worthy to be elevated to such a status. Should the king show himself to be unfit for the role by failing to show judge, good judgment, generosity or courage, the goddess had every right to withdraw her support, resulting in most cases of the death of the king, enabling her to choose a better candidate for the role. Um, this is not something that could be uh, allowed in the world of early and mid um, medieval Ireland. So Monin is recast as a witch casting evil spells. Um, she's explicitly, it's explicitly said she dies on Samhain Eve. Um, so it is from this that Samhain is called the Feast of Monin by the common folk, for she was a powerful and a great witch. Um, therefore, it used to be a tradition which has now died out that on uh, Halloween, ordinary people asked her for their wishes. They made wishes and cast spells so that money would help them. Um, so uh, the, her, her depiction is of an evil scheming witch. Um, and it's quite common to have these sovereignty goddesses depicted as that in later versions of the tale. What's interesting, though, is the depiction of her as a witch is contained specifically in a 14th century manuscript. And it's within this period that you begin to find the... Uh, the seeds of the later mania that would s strike across Europe uh, as the witch hunts of the 16th and 17th centuries. The intellectual um, beginnings of that mix of demonic belief and folk magic, which led to accusations of magic, begin here. Um, Ireland didn't have witch trials in the Middle Ages, not even in the early modern period. There's about four major witch trials in Ireland that are of any note. Uh, it's really quite interesting. Um, it just didn't gel here. We do, though, have the dubious honour of having one of the earliest and most significant witch trials um, of this woman. This is her old house, Alice Kettler. Everyone will have heard of her. She's become a figure of legend. This is Ireland's so-called first witch, as she's known, uh, which I wouldn't mind being known as, in fairness. It's not a bad way to go, is it? 
You know, Miss Ireland's first witch? Nice, okay. Uh, she was a very wealthy, uh, middle-aged woman living in Kilkenny in early 14th century Ireland. Uh, she worked as a merchant and a money lender, which if that wasn't enough to arouse jealousy, nothing was. And she had acquired four husbands, uh, which also kept her busy. It was her stepchildren from her fourth marriage uh, to Sir John Le Poir, who raised the accusations of sorcery against Alice around the year 1324. And once they did that, all her other stepchildren joined in. Uh, Alice was very rich. She had accumulated uh, dowers from her four husbands. So a dower is when your husband uh, died in the Middle Ages, you get a third of everything he had, and you keep it even if you marry again. So if you get several husbands, you're well away. You've got lots of money. So Alice was doing the right thing in many ways. Um, the stepchildren were very resentful um, of her. They said she had acquired her wealth through bewitch bewitchment and murder. They complained bitterly that Alice had used sorcery to kill their fathers. And they may have had a point, in <laughs> fairness. Because poor old Sir John Le Poir shows all the signs of having been poisoned with arsenic. So Alice may not have been entirely innocent, but she certainly wasn't a witch. Um, she had one son, a man called William Outlaw, and they said she was obsessed with making him uh, rich. At that time, um, a new bishop arrived, and his name was Bishop Ledreed, and he was an Englishman. And he was educated at Avignon. Avignon was the centre, it was where the papacy was at that time, and it was the centre of a kind of a very heated and kind of fervent hotbed of thinking about demonic magic. This is what Europe's great thinkers were thinking about at that time. And Ladrid was there and he was, he was imbibing all of this and he brought it back with him to Kilkenny. So this is a period during which heresy and demonology are being outlined and sort of solidified within papal balls. Um, his patron was Pope John the Twenty Second, who's famously afraid of witches and often claimed that his life was in danger from witchcraft. He's the first one who called witchcraft a heresy against the church, so that's got the floodgates opening now for prosecutions. So Ladreed um, arrived in Ossery, Bishop of Ossery, and heard about Alice and decided to hold an inquisition, basically, into Alice. Um, he accused Dame Alice and William Outlaw of being her son, and various others of being sorcerers, heretics, and of leading followers into organised heresy and witchcraft. He accused them of communicating with demons, of having the name of the evil one stamped on the sacred host, and offering sacrifices to Satan. Here's the charges now. Um, it's the classic mix of high church thinking on demonology and a mix of folk magic. These are the seven major charges that are brought against Alice and her associates, that they denied Christ in the church, that they cut up living animals and scattered the pieces at crossroads. Crossroads are liminal places where you meet the devil. As offerings to a demon called the Son of Art in return for his help, that they stole the keys of the church and held meetings there at night. That in the skull of a robber, they placed the intestines and internal organs of cocks, worms, nails cut from dead bodies, hairs from the buttocks, and clothes from boys who had died before being baptised. That from this brew, they made potions to incite people to love, hate, kill, and afflict Christians. That Alice herself had a certain demon as incubus, which is a lover, a demon lover, by whom she permitted herself to be known carnally, and that he appeared to her rather alarmingly as either a cat, a shaggy black dog, or a black man, Ethiopus, from whom she received her wealth. They had fevered imaginations, 14th century clerics, and that Alice had used sorcery to murder some of her husbands, maybe, um, and to infatuate others, with the result that they gave all their possessions to her and her son, William Outlaw, thus impoverishing her stepchildren. Furthermore, it was claimed that the fourth husband was being poisoned, he was emaciated, his nails fell out, and his body hair all fell out as well. And apparently it's consistent with poisoning. And apparently Alice kept a chest in her house that was always locked 
that only Alice had the keys to and that no one else was allowed to look into. So the mind boggles. In fairness, they probably had a point, but I don't think she was regularly having sex with a black cat or putting stuff in empty skulls. Um, she used to use spells, they said, and the spell she used, the use of magic, is she would take a brush and brush the filth of the streets towards her son, the door of her son, while all the time mumbling to the house of William, my son, high all the wealth of Kilkenny town. So people said that she was a witch doing spells. Uh, this is uh, far beyond what the stepchildren started out as. But this is what happened when you bring accusations of witchcraft. The details of her activities include grave robbing, concocting powders. Uh, she's also accused of um, uh, making candles from human fat. There's all kinds of stuff going on. This is the perfect prototype of the witch trials that came afterwards in Europe. This is like the testing ground for this. It's a really interesting case. After this, you see this uh, uh, develop and spread right across the European continent. Where it took, this took in the soil of Europe, it didn't take here accusations of magic like this. Um, why not? Why didn't it take? Um, it could be that it's because, um, as, as Ronald Hutton reckons, who's one of the foremost historians of magic and witchcraft, he reckons it's because the Irish interactions with magic working um, and the people who acted as magic workers were different because there's such a strong belief in, in the she or the fairies and there's such an idea that if you hurt someone who intercedes with the she, people didn't want to hurt them. So they didn't want to take that risk because your local magic worker protected you against fairies. This fairy belief was still strong. So you weren't going to take that risk of having your cattle injured by the fairies, of having your house disturbed by the fairies. So there's that idea as well. But I have a quote here which probably sums up why the Irish didn't do it. This is a quote from a relative of Alice, um, a man called Arnold Le Poer, who was the seneschal of Kilkenny. Alice was very well connected. And even though... <coughs> Even though in medieval Ireland there were essentially two societies at work, there's the Anglo-Irish or the, the English in Ireland who adhered to English common law and who defined themselves as the English in Ireland, and then there's all the, the, the Gaelic world. Even though they're separate, they, they intermix and they, they mash, they marry, they swap cultural assumptions and cultural practices. And Al Napoir made a speech, apparently, um, and remember, he's, he's, he's um, appointed by the English king. He gives his loyalty to the English king, but there's a very strong sense of identity of not being English. And what he said was, if some vagabond from England has obtained his bull in the Pope's court, we do not have to obey it unless enjoined on us by the king's seal. He also claimed, as you well know, heretics have never been found in Ireland which has always been called the Island of Saints. Now, this uh, foreigner comes from England and says we are all heretics and excommunicates. Defamation of this country affects every one of us, so we must all unite against this man. So, basically, even if she did sleep with the devil, because a foreigner said so, there's no way she's going to go to prison for it. She was spirited away. She was never seen again. Um, the punishment for her son stayed and his punishment was to roof uh, Kilkenny Cathedral in lead and he spent so much on it and it weighed so much that it eventually all collapsed which some people say was Alice's work as well um, so that's, that's basically the. I mean that's, that's what we have I mean there are some witchcraft trials in the 17th and 18th centuries which follow the classic one of a young girl who becomes hysterical and makes accusations but it doesn't, it doesn't stick it just doesn't stick, this idea that magic workers uh, have to be punished. Um, Alice's case uh, exposes a culture clash uh, in many ways between the colonised English world of medieval Ireland um, along with the Gaelic one against the formal English world that supposedly administered it. And I say English in the sense of the wider European world, which, which was accepting of these ideas of a mix of demonology and heresy when it came to witchcraft. Um, it didn't happen here. And part of the reason it didn't happen is because witchcraft, magic working, is also sort of accepted within the religious practice of people in Ireland, which is also highly unusual. 
Um, if you look at uh, existing sources like penitentials, which are basically uh, guides to sinning and the, uh, the requisite uh, penalties and saints' lives, uh, these consistently portray acts of magic. Now, sometimes these acts of magic are evil and destructive, but there are also acts of magic which the saints carry out and which religious uh, ecclesiastical types uh, engage in. So it is a very odd mishmash, and people don't really seem to know where they stand on it because they feel like they need to condemn magic, then they're not really sure because they use magic themselves. So uh, if we look at this, this is uh, one, of, um, one of four charms, which is called the St. Gall Charms, from a manuscript from the 9th century. Uh, it was found in a library in, in Switzerland. And um, it's written uh, by an Irish monk who's part of the great kind of diaspora of scholars who spread out from Ireland in the uh, early medieval period and kind of went all across Europe uh, and across Britain. Uh, this manuscript, uh, the manuscript 1395, is a collection of fragments from various periods, but uh, the page of Irish, Irish origin is apparently 9th century in date. It contains four healing charms known as the Sengal incantations. Um, and what's interesting about this is, is that each one of them has an instruction about ritual performance. So again, it's about doing it in a particular way that has a performative angle to it. Uh, the texts combine verse and prose and include instructions on how exactly to say these charms, including uh, how to speak them, uh, write them, and maybe involving singing as well. Um, it's written on the back of a, a picture of St. Matthew, um, so it was originally a page from a pocket gospel. So someone's carrying around a pocket gospel with this stuff written in it, and what's interesting is a pagan god is mentioned in it as well. Um, nothing is higher than heaven, nothing is deeper than the sea. By the holy words that Christ spoke from his cross, remove from me the thorn, a thorn which wounds, whoever it is. I strike a blow on it which makes it spring out, which makes it spring forward which drives it out. Very harsh, God knows wisdom. That's the Tuha De Danan, Smithy God. Uh, the point of God knew, before the point of God knew, let it step out of him. Uh, and then underneath is, this charm is put in butter, which does not go into water. Now, that seems to mean butter that wasn't washed as part of the process. And from it is smeared all around the thorn, and it does not go on the point of the wound. And if the thorn be not there, one of the two teeth in front of his head will fall out. So uh, you can actually curse someone with it as well, it seems to be from that as well. Uh, so Gubnu is the divine smith of the Tuatha Dé Danann. So an Irish cleric in the 9th century is writing down basically a spell, uh, invoking uh, a god of the Tuatha Dé Danann. So people are still comfortable with aspects of magic, even very religious people like this. Let's look at another... Uh, oh, have I got it written down? I don't. I thought I had it in. I'll read it out. The famous prayer attributed to St. Patrick, the deer's cry, uh, shows a different kind of belief in magic, a one that magic is destructive. I summon today all those powers between me and every cruel, merciless power that may oppose my body and my soul against the incantations of false prophets, against black laws of paganism, against the false laws of heresy, against the deceit of idolatry, against the spells of women and smiths and druids. So that was St. Patrick's cry for help. That's the official line. But what we can see is at the same time this is going on, people are still saying, well, God knew if you wouldn't mind taking out the thorn, I'd really appreciate it and making a sign of the cross at the same time, no doubt. Magic in Irish sources, we can see magic being used to make potions, to make charms, um, to get rid of unwanted babies. St. Bridget is one of four saints who are known as the abortionist saints of Ireland because they make fetuses disappear in their hagiographies. There are also remedies for... I can see you smiling there. <laughs> She's like, really? Um, uh, this is all uh, quite interesting stuff because um, magic is associated with controlling bodily uh, systems quite a lot. And because women do that, magic begins to be seen as a woman's art. Um, what really worries um, the men who run Irish society, though, in this period is the fact that magic is used 
to uh, inflame lust and also to cause impotence. And this really causes them quite a bit of worry um, all across uh, the uh, legal and religious spectrum. These type of magical practices are singled out in the existing sources predominantly because, as Lisa Battelle has written, they subversively aimed the devious weapon of spells and potions at the patrilineal, uh, patrilineal kin group, the community and all orderly congenial gender relations. So if women are interrupting things like the making of heirs and uh, the you know, normal satisfying of lusts after marriage, this is a problem for the kin group. So it's a problem for greater um, Irish society. Uh, women who practice magic are seen as agents of chaos, in, a, in essence. But female magic working isn't always so easy to condemn, especially when it's carried out once again by a saint. Here she is, St. Bridget, uh, Ireland's premier female saint. Uh, Irish saints' hagiographies are full of um, magic, full of marvels, full of magic working. It's seen as better than pagan because it called on God. So it's not really seen as magic in that sense, but essentially it is. And we can see one example of magic working in a case study uh, from St. Bridget's hagiography. There are four versions of the life of St. Bridget. What I'll look at is the old Irish one, which is written down um, shortly after, between around the eighth century. It's written down, it supposedly happened around the sixth century. Um, so what happens is essentially St. Bridget is going about her work and a man comes into her. It says, a man of Kells by origin, whom his wife hated, came to Bridget for help. Bridget blessed some water. He took it with him and his wife, having been sprinkled therewith, uh, she straight away loved him passionately. Job done. <laughs> it doesn't work, I'm just saying that. <laughs> you need a saint. <laughs> Good luck with finding one in modern Ireland. Uh, <laughs> don't exist anymore. Let's take a little look, though, at the later version of her life. Uh, Middle Irish one, slightly later, about 200 years after this. Um, she is specifically asked by him for a spell in that one. And in this particular um, uh, version as well, she uses what are called words of power. Um, again, in the Irish tradition, words have power. So he asks her for a spell or a charm to make his wife love him. Um, in the Irish legal tradition, and even in the penitentials, the use of magic to make people love you is severely outlawed. It's seen as a very bad thing indeed, but it's okay if St. Bridget can do it, apparently. Um, so she's asked for a spell, and in this one, it's even more um, successful in the sense that they live together forever and it's all marvellous. But she's interfering in the natural processes because she's using magic as a spell to bring these two together. If they don't want to be together, that's fine, but she's subverting the nature of reality. Um, but it seems to be okay. She blesses water and utters words of power over it. So it is really quite interesting. Um, she uh, would have been condemned for it in a later time. For example, poor old Alice and Petronilla, if she'd lived in that time, she would have been in a very severe state. But she's a premier Irish saint, and she's doing this, and she's actually getting away with it. Um, the penitential of Finian, for example, is the oldest Irish penitential. It was written in five, before 591, and it refers to magic as an evil deed. And love magic is a very serious transgression, more serious than any other kind of magic. For example, Finian says, if any cleric or woman who practices magic, have led astray anyone by their magic, it is a monstrous sin, but it can be expiated by penance. Such an offender shall do penance for six years, three years on an allowance of bread and water, and during the remaining three years he shall abstain from wine and meat. If, however, such a person has not led astray anyone, but has given something for the sake of wanton love to someone, he shall do penance be a magical object that you would secrete. He shall do penance for an entire year on an allowance of bread and water. If a woman by her magic destroys the child she has conceived of somebody, she shall do penance for half a year with an allowance of bread and water and abstain for two years from wine and meat and fast for the six 40-day periods with bread and water. So the performers associated with love magic are women and sometimes clerics as well. 
Um, the, the idea of being given something to induce love is not clear either, um, but it's probably stuff like herbs, plants, roots, um, communion wafers, things like that. Uh, so pre- Ireland's premier magician, premier uh, saint would have been in serious trouble um, with her magic working. So I haven't got, I'm, I'm running over time here. I'm going to very quickly finish up. I'm going to say love magic is also dealt with, because um, this might make you giggle, there's um, a list of offences that deal with supernatural arts in the, in, the, um, in the laws. And one of them is deals with bed witchcraft. And it literally means a supernatural attack of a bed. That's not to say the bed gets up and starts hitting you around the head when you're trying to climb into it. But it means that someone bewitches the bed and you can't, a man is rendered impotent and you can't conceive a child and that's seen as extremely uh, worrying. It's an Irish society that depends on uh, the next generations coming through and continuing to carry on the kin group so uh, that's seen as extremely important to make sure that the next generations come through. Um, I'm going to finish up, I'll very briefly talk about um, reference to this woman because I want to bring it up closer this is the cottage of Biddy Early. I've spoken about cunning folk, wise men uh, and cunning, uh, wise women and cunning men. This idea of powerful female magical practitioners is very much embodied in the cottage that this once was. It was the home of Biddy Early from Clare, who had, of course, the famous blue bottle that apparently she got from the fairies and she could use to do all manner of things. She could heal people, she could see into the future, she could commune with ghosts. Um, the church wasn't too keen on her, but became accepted towards the end. Uh, Biddy could also apparently bilocate and things like that. So magic in Ireland has a very long history of practitioners. It repeatedly sees women very much, but not uh, always associated with its practice, especially when it comes to love magic and the darker sides of that. Men are there too, of course, but they're seen sometimes as more formal practitioners that you would hire to do things. Uh, The Irish magical magical tradition is a mix of pagan inheritance and Catholic glosses. It it enabled it to avoid the worst excesses of the witch trials and enabled a strong folk magic tradition to survive. It's still alive today. You can walk into Barnes, um, uh, the length of the land, and see red. If you see red material tied up anywhere in a barn, that's to protect cattle from the fairies because they hate the colour red. So that kind of stuff is still ongoing here. There's a simultaneous fascination and revulsion for magic in the Irish tradition. And interestingly, I was really interested to see the latest census results show a a sharp increase in the numbers of people who identify as pagan, which is really interesting, who are generally practitioners of magic. Perhaps even as I speak, somewhere in Dublin, someone is shoving nails and urine into a bottle and burying it in a 21st century version what we talked about today. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone.